Morning guys, <laughs> Dr. Ken Norberg again with another deer hunting seminar by the fire. <laughs> Boy, I'm anxious to get out there now. I I kind of think uh, we'll, we'll finally head north in a couple of weeks and start and make our first scouting trip. So, and it, you'll see some woods behind me eventually here. But I, I got a really good seminar here for you today. There's some landmarks in Nordberg deer hunting in this in this particular uh, hunt. Uh, I, I, this hunt is about my oldest daughter when she was only 13, 14, took the second largest buck ever taken by a Nordberg. And she did in such what I consider to be such a female way of hunting. And <laughs> that might sound kind of silly. Uh, until my daughter came to deer camp. And the reason she came is when I was instructing my oldest son, who was younger, uh, how to handle a rifle safely, you know, when deer hunting, she came over and sat next to me and put her arm around her shoulders and said, Dan, how come I can't go deer <laughs> And I looked at her and I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why she shouldn't be able to go deer hunting. And I told her, well, if you'd like to, you're going to go deer hunting. <laughs> and that started something new, and I'll tell you about that, too. That's really great. Before I get going, though, i got to thank you guys. <laughs> kind of another landmark. You know, all summer long, and, you know, I'm not... <laughs> All summer long, I've been reluctant to spend money. Boy, I've been really tight with me, tight fisted with my money because you just don't know what the future was going to be, you know. And so I've been saving and saving, and the uh, same way you got, you know, I've, I've been <laughs> almost begging people to buy books. You know, that's one of my major ways of of uh, making a living. That's my, been my job for, oh, since 1980, well, I've been, that's been my major source of income. And, uh, well, with the coronavirus around, that everybody's been complaining about business. You know, it just isn't good, you know. But suddenly, this past weekend, we had a huge surge <laughs> in numbers of book orders. And right now, you know, and I... We were, John and I were a little worried about this because we were getting starting to get low on books, and so we made a we ordered we a new printing next big printing coming up, and that takes a little while, you know, get the printing done and bindery and all that and shipping and finally arrives here, uh, so we figure we better not wait any longer. Let's get that order in. So we did that. Well, this last weekend. We sold out all the books. Well, this is the last one, and this one's going to Canada. A guy named Kevin. The last book from the last big printing that we did, and from here on, we aren't going to have any. Sometime this week, this coming during the next probably six, seven days, we'll have our books, and we'll be able to fill orders. We've got some orders now. We can't fill them until those books get there, but it won't be long, and <laughs> so. I, I just want to thank you guys. That's really great. I really appreciate that. And you're going to love your books. <laughs> you sure will. You'll see. When you start reading this, you're going to be amazed at what you're going to learn from this book. So, uh, anyway, that's I, I had to slip that in there. Thank you. Thank you a lot. You know, it made life seem a lot nicer. <laughs> so, and you're going to think so too when you read that book. Now, like I said earlier, uh, this is a story about how my oldest daughter, when she was just a little twerp, <laughs> got the second biggest buck ever taken by a Nordberg. And uh, I remember when I was telling my Uncle Jack about this, and, and he, he was really sober about that. He was looking at these pictures and shaking his head. And <laughs> I remember asking him, you know, how many bucks have you shot 11 feet away that were just standing there? <laughs> and he said, well, I don't 
ever shot one that close and just standing there. No, I, you know, I, I know, cause, you know, I hunted with my, the Narva gang that made drives, it, that's all I did for 15 years. So I knew what he was going to have to say. It. And it, it never had standing deer that close, you know, that's kind of amazing. <laughs> And I, even guys in their own gang, I remember when Peggy got her first buck, this nice eight-pointer, the first year that she hunted, early in the morning, opening morning. Some of the other guys in our gang, in my new gang of stand hunters, were shaking their heads and said, how come we never see bucks like that just only 11 feet away? How come <laughs> this is happening? Well, the guy that asked me, I, you know, I, I could understand why he might think that because there wasn't much of a chance he would ever see one that close the way he, the way he hunted. Well, yeah, I shouldn't make fun of him. He was a, he was a great guy. <laughs> and then I asked my uncle, and then I showed him the big deer, the picture, and said, how many of those have you taken it since you've been hunting? Oh, I never got one that big. <laughs> As we're taking bucks every year, you know, older bucks every year. That's amazing. <laughs> but you know, they never that gang never quit making drives. They that was just a tradition. They come there, they'd have pancakes and bacon or, or Canadian bacon, you know, uh, on opening morning at, at Jack's house, you know, everybody going there. And uh, Lila my aunt, she'd be making pancakes and the kitchen was filled with smoke. <laughs> Every time I come in there with their hunting clothes on, you know, jacket off. But, and so, boy, were they getting their clothes being scented by that smoke. <laughs> but nobody thought about it in those days, you know. They go stamping cow pies and put cedar boughs in their pockets and they figure, boy, now the deer won't be able to smell me. That, we didn't know those things back then, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, it was that was kind of amazing. Well, let's get back to the story now. For all oh, two three years, uh, I I knew a really big buck, big tracks. I never saw him, but he had four inch tracks. He was big, and he was a dominant breeding buck. He was making. Uh, antler rubs and ground scrapes all over this country here. That was back in the days when first frost come in October, man, he would have big ground scrapes and antler rubs all over this area, uh, almost overnight, and usually at traditional sites, but that's another story. But anyway, we knew he, and I finally figured out he lived there, and the spot that he lived we came to know called the castle. And the reason we called it a castle is that it was on an island, about 11, actually about 11 acres in size, not as big as it's depicted on this map here, but it was out in the middle of a big elder swamp, and there was a little moat going out here, uh, not a moat, but a little trail, you know, like a bridge going into a castle, and then instead of water, a moat around the castle, like in days when People lived in castles. It was, it was surrounded by an elder swamp full of water, big, big puddles of black water all over the place. And not very easy to get through. Hunters never, I'm about the only goofball that would regularly tramp through uh, elder swamps in this country. Uh, that, this was all elder swamp east of where we hunted. It was an old logging trail, it was muddy. Um, you could easily get stuck on this old logging trail if you didn't know how to drive in that area and how to be prepared for them. But anyway, big elder swamp here, and on the, on the other side of us, west of us, was a huge spruce bog. And honest to gosh, that spruce bog is 20 miles across. Huge. You know, mossy and with water, you know, so you walk in there and go squish, squish under your boots. And full of spruce trees, you know, they're black looking, they're called white spruces, but thick. And there'd be some mossy openings in there. But there were little islands out in that swamp where deer with, with bucks in particular would stay, yeah, older bucks. And we had one out there up oh, down this way, it was a mile from across the thing to get to this island. 
was a little bigger than my brother and I started going out there when it seemed like we were never going to get a deer away. I always got a deer when we went out there. It was a bigger one so that there was does living on it as well as bucks. And uh, so it was a good spot to hunt. But anyway, this big spruce bog here. Now, this buck here was one of the few bucks I've ever known, except in farm areas, that had a, a home range two square miles in size. It was big and aggressive enough so he could control that large of an area. Uh, most bucks only have one square mile. But I've known a couple of others since then that, that were that large, and I've known some farm bucks that had areas maybe a lot longer in distance, but not as wide, but easily two square miles in size when you put it all together. So, but he was, he was a big, aggressive buck. And uh, quite, sometimes he had several does with him. And, you know, usually when the does in this area were in heat, they were only, they were only in heat 24 hours or 26 hours. When they're in heat, they don't wait around for the buck to show up. They don't go by a ground scrape like some people believe and wait there until a buck comes along. If they did that, a lot of them would never be bred. So when they when they want to be bred, they'd head to that buck's uh, bedding area up to, there on the castle. You'd find their tracks on this trail, this little bitty ridge, dry ridge, not high above where all the water was on both sides. Elders just thick elders all laced together, you know, they get to be 10 feet tall, growing in clumps and the, and the, the trunks all interlaced. It's just a terrible place to go through. But they, they had an emer another trail that went through that bog or that swamp over here. And there, there, was, there was only three ways they would go in and out. There was a trail that went across this little narrows here, and this one, and this one. And so when we find their tracks, you know, on Highland, fresh tracks going out across there or this way, usually they didn't go there until it was, the water was frozen and thick enough so they could walk through there without sinking down into deep water. And a lot of blowdowns in there, kind of miserable thing to cross, but it was an area they used. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, we kept talking about this buck that lived out on this castle. And he got to be known as the castle buck. And he was just kind of the buck we all dreamt someday of getting, you know. Oh, we gotta get that castle buck. And several times I tried going out there, and and my son Dave as well, and to see if we could get that thing. We built a tree stand in there right up close to where on this edge here, going out this way. But as I learned, that buck had a habit of laying where he could watch this trail going in there. And it just never worked. Any time you went or day or night, early in the morning, hour before first light, didn't matter. He would know you're there. And you just wouldn't see him there. I saw him once, one morning, in the dark. And before, well before it was time to be able to shoot. So other than that, never saw him. So this one particular year when we were up there, gee, it would be nice to get that castle buck. And, and we know, I noticed when I went out that morning, the wind was from the northeast. And I was thinking about, you know, this might be the day. Now, this was the first time, you know, you know we were still... I guess you could say in our infancy as far as tree stand hunting was concerned. You know, we were developing better ways of doing it and better stands. You couldn't buy any when we were when we were doing this. We had started tree stand hunting back in the 60s and making our own platforms up in trees and finally really fancy permanent stands with railings and ladders and all that made with, with um, wood, you know, from trunks of trees that had recently fallen down, that kind of thing. But permanent, and when they were legal back then. So, and during that time before that, when I was doing a lot of research up there, I built some permanent tree stands in several places, like, like there, and there's one over here, 
to observe Neil year round. I'd go out there many times during the year to observe whitetails in different seasons, see what they're doing, and get close to where they wintered, and all kinds of things up there. So I had these set up here. And so we had been talking about the castle about the night before, and the next morning the wind was from the northeast. And <laughs> I was saying, that was back in the days when we used catalytic, Coleman catalytic uh, heaters to heat our tent. And boy, talk about, <laughs> that was really inadequate, but it was the best we had back in those days. But, but anyway, today we're going to see if we can get that castle buck, and we're going to all take part or at least almost all take part. And uh, I was thinking that, my, I didn't voice that part out loud, but, you know, during the years, well before my kids started deer hunting, I'd take them with me, we'd go grouse hunting, and when they go scarling, I'd take them along. And so, some, some of these tree stands that I made, the kids helped build them. And so they knew we were there, and we had, selected trails for going in and out. And, and these were well known by my three boys. And they had been in there, in and out, and uh, like John had already been hunting for, oh, what, two, three years before this. So I knew the boys could get to these in the dark, get there to their stands half hour before first light on their own. I didn't have to worry about them. And those were marked, you know, so they could follow them in the dark. So I decided, well, we're going to cover the three trails here that the, any buck or any other deer that might be involved here, like a doe and heap, would use going in and out of that castle area. And so we, uh, John, I told John to go here, because that was a more difficult one. These were easier for the other boys, the younger boys, to go in. And Ken went there, and we called that one a tower stand. <laughs> you know, before that time, even if, uh, it was our tree stands, uh, our regulations stipulated your tree stand couldn't be higher than six feet above the ground. Well, the finally they, they, went, they raised it to nine feet, and when we built this stand here, tree stand, it was nine feet, and it seemed so high compared to six feet. We called it the tower stand. <laughs> well, Dave was out here. One, day, one year, Dave got two bucks just a couple days apart at one over here, so he knew that one really well. But anyway, we, uh, and, but I didn't have any others, and uh, I was going to, it was my plan to go around here and come to this little point here and get close to the castle here where I could see this trail that ringed the swamp around the edge. I was going to be right there. And the wind was from this direction, northeast, going like that. So I thought, boy, that'd be a good way to go in there and good for everybody uh, to go in there and get to a stand site without being smelled by any deer in the castle. Or, and so we thought, well, that's, a, that's good, a good plan. The only thing is I didn't have anything else prepared. so. It, this was a stand site my daughter Peggy knew. She helped build that, and I knew she could go in here. So I remember telling her, I'd like you to go to that stance. And just in case the buck gets around all of us, he might take a notion to go out to this big spruce bog. Boy, when they get out there, you don't have a chance unless you hunt that big island out there. But So you go there. But I was thinking all along that she had the least likely of spots to take that big buck. But she was sure she'd go there, you know. And she, by then she was using a 30-30 carbine, a Winchester Model 94, 30-30. Uh, and so she had a little better gun and she could shoot longer range and she had sights. They were open sights, but she had sights. There weren't any on that two, 410 shotgun that she had. So. That morning then, our camp was down here, everybody was all squared away, well this is what we're going to do. You guys all go to your stand sites, all around here, we'll cover all bases. You know, I, afterwards I called it cover all bases, stand hunting, it's a large group stand hunting method. And the idea is to cover every spot where you think that buck is going to travel during the half day you're there. 
And if we do that, and if we, you know, if we know this is what's going to happen, you know, these are the only trails that you're likely to see them on, then that's covering all bases to take that buck. And we've used that several times over the years, always got the big one. And it seemed like every time I set up one, like, <laughs> it's not me that gets it. Somebody else in the group gets it. And there's some bucks on the wall that were taken with cover all bases uh, stand hunting technique. But they aren't mine. <laughs> Someone else. But that's all right. But I had all these eager young kids and oh boy, we're all excited. We're going to hunt the castle buck this morning. So they took off, went down this old logging road to their assigned trails to go in, you know, like that and down there. So. This old logging trail, like I said, it was a pretty rough trail. It wasn't, uh, it had mud holes and, all, and brush growing along. And, and sometimes, you know, you could hardly see down the road because everything was closed in and up or above six feet or more. And so, not much of a road, actually. So, deer cross that without any hesitation when they were there in this area here. So, Anyway, they went down there and all being careful like they were supposed to, you know. And Peggy was going in this direction, but the idea was if the buck got around us that maybe he'd use this trail to go into this big spruce bog, which happened a lot. You know, when a, when a deer would, a, a buck would abandon his range, he didn't abandon it by going into that huge elder swamp and all that water and stuff. Much better to go out here and get to one of these little islands and stay out there during the remaining part of the, of the hunting season. So that's kind of why I thought that might happen. I thought it might happen this way too, you know, if something didn't work right. So anyway, while everybody did that, I went through that little trail across this little strip of elder swamp. Here went on their little ridge and then followed the edge of the swamp up to about here where it turned. And then from that point, if I went by compass, if I went straight north with, by compass, I could hit that little ridge there. If I started out anywhere else, I wouldn't, couldn't be sure I'd ever hit that thing. So I always went up here. I've done this a few times. I went straight, and that's a terrible trip across an elder swamp in the dark. You know. Kept my compass in hand, a flashlight here, and my rifle on a sling and sneaking across that thing. And that was before we used tools. You know, we, we sat on logs and stumps and things like that when we, st and we were stand hunting. We were in, got up in our tree stands. So anyway, it went across there, that long, terrible trip. And it was, I always felt good when I finally saw tall trees here. You know, up ahead, oh, there, I'm here. <laughs> and get up on there, and then it was dry, a little ridge, kind of like this one, a little wider. And so I kept going, and, to, and there was a nice big log here, the convenient one to sit on, and from there I could watch this trail around the, through here. It's a perfect spot. So I sat there in the dark, you know, no flashlight on or anything, and real quiet. Sat there for, oh, 20, 30 minutes, and it started to get light, and I could see over there, and, and I could see from where I was sitting that there were fresh deer tracks on that trail over there. I thought, oh, this is really good. But finally it was full light and nothing, didn't see any deer. And, and I was getting a little frustrated. I think maybe I should move up a little closer so maybe I can see up here a little ways on that highland, little highland there. So I stood up to go. And when I stood up, all of a sudden there was all kinds of racket right over here on my right. Deer trail, deer tails bobbing all over the place. I, you know, at the time I said, it had to be a dozen deer. You know, apparently in that particular year there were several does and he at the same time. You know, they, they're spaced out over two weeks usually, but it must have been several. And then, and they were there with their young, you know, the yearlings following them and their fawns following them and they're all there ganged up. And it looked like at least a dozen deer. And I never figured out, it might have been 11, might have even been 10, but I think it was 12. And there was tails going. And oh, geez, I had been sitting there all that time 
within 30 yards of the nearest tree. They were in an area there of maybe 40, 50 yards in diameter in moss there on the edge of that highland bedded there under big cedar trees and all kinds of spruce along the edge there. And so you just get little glimpses of these tails going. <laughs> and I remember swinging my rifle, looking at my scope, and uh, looking for antlers. And then I saw them, and it was gone. And I didn't see it anymore. And pretty soon it was all quiet again. And I, what a disappointment. I mean, I was, after all that trip, in the dark, and especially across that elder swamp, it was such a disappointment. Well, with that, I went, I walked up onto this here, and I waited, I took my time and waited, sat on a log or two up there, and didn't really expect to see anything. Those deer had scattered out, really. Some of them looked like they were going straight in that direction, away from there, in, deeper into that big swamp. And, there, you know, you can't follow a deer in an elder swamp. There's no way to be silent in a place like that. So I figured, well, I'll take my time, and, and I won't rush out here. Maybe a deer will end up over there. Maybe someone will come back and get over onto this trail so, or this. Never knew what was going to happen. I know when we made drives, and gee, you know, we had 11 guys in our gang. And some of our drives were a mile long and quite wide apart. You know, we'd have six, seven guys on the driving crew driving to four along an old gravel road on the, on the north end of the drive, and we keep uh, to our compass direction so we didn't get off course, you know, and it'd take us a couple hours to make a drive like that. <laughs> and so one of the things I learned early, one reason I was getting to the point where I was just not wanting to do any more making drives is that one of the things big bucks did, besides laying down between drivers, they'd hear them coming, or smell them coming, and, and lay down and take cover, maybe get under next to her under a great big fallen evergreen tree and wait and wait till the drivers go by and then they could go back in the other way and the driver never knew they were there. And I I've done that several times and watched them do that. I've watched big bucks do that. Well a lot, in many cases, they recognize, oh, here comes a drive. You can hear noise over here, people walking, somebody's talking, you know, and there's guys over here, and there's a whole bunch went over there somewhere, and, and you can smell them and hear them coming, and you know it's a drive, and some of those bucks know, well, if I go crosswind one way or the other, I can finally get around, them, you know, finally get to the point where you don't smell any more humans coming. So now I'm away from the drivers, and so now I'm safe. You know, they outflank the drivers. So you know, in a case like this, this big buck might might be thinking I can outflank any hunter. I might smell, although, you know, like if we were, somebody was making a drive there, so I, you know, so it might end up swinging around one side or the other, but probably not through the elder swamp. Buck with big antlers wouldn't have much fun in an elder swamp. But anyway, the wind was in our favor. Anyway, I took my time and I finally got out here and, and uh, Ken was here and uh, I sent him over to get John and pretty soon Dave came down this way. He, was, he had nothing had happened so he was finally starting back and it was oh, around 10 o'clock when we got together. And well, more like 10.30. And we were standing over here talking to each other and, I told him what happened, you know, I saw the I saw the castle buck and he was really big and boy, but they're all out in that elder swamp somewhere. <laughs> anyway, and all these other deer that were with him. And uh, so we were all shaking our heads and, uh, and all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> we were shot over in this direction. <laughs> One shot. And we were all, I remember we were all looking at you, what, you think Peggy shot? You know, we didn't think. It could be the castle buck, but you know, there was other bucks here. Nice bucks with big tracks. I find them on, on trail, deer trails around all through this area here. And we have tree stands all across this area, all the way out to there. But anyway, 
we were wondering, I wonder if that was Peggy. <laughs> so we walked back out here, and when we got out to the road, here comes Peggy coming down there. And, and you know, the day before uh, that year, Dave shot a buck, you know. Young Dave, I just, <laughs> 33 roughly got from his grandpa, Hedquist, and uh, he, uh, he had shot a deer, and it was a seven-pointer. It was decent rock, but it was a seven, and he wanted me to have it mounted, and I called him, geez, Dave, we don't, we don't mount seven-pointers. <laughs> well, it's got to be eight or bigger, you know. Bigger is better, even. And he was really disappointed about that, and his grandfather was not far from him when he shot him, so he, my, my dad went over to where Dave was, and Dave didn't know anything about how to field dress a deer back then. Now he's just slick as can be, he can do one so quickly. But anyway, he uh, didn't know anything about it, so my dad did it, and he was not ever very good at that either. <laughs> and, but they managed to get it, and so he was all excited. He, I mean, Dave got a he got a big buck, you know. And well, to a young kid like he was, that looked that seven pointer looked awfully big. <laughs> and so we were walking up here, and we were all on the road, and here was Peggy walking toward us, and she had a smile on her face, and. She, she got up close, and the kids, you know, they're competitive. You know, young kids can be. She says, "Dave, I got one bigger than you." <laughs> Dave, Dave had always been real competitive, you know. And boy, that's you know, the kid. He wasn't terribly disappointed, but he thought he was going to have the big buck of the year of that year. <laughs> but and but we didn't know, you know. But then she says, "Dad, I think I got the castle buck." Because it's really big. <laughs> really? Oh my, well, let's go look at it. So we all had to crawl back and go over to here. And he had about 30 yards away on a deer trail. She was in her stand right there. And this buck had been walking real slow, heading down, heading toward the spruce barn. He was all alone. But it was a big buck. She could see that. Gee, what big antlers. Much bigger than her eight pointer that she got the year before. So at 33, took her time, didn't have to hurry, and, and shot, and down it went, right where she had it. It didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Unlike the buck she got with the 410 slug, it ran about 100 yards before it went down. But anyway, uh, there it was, and it was big. <laughs> yeah, I said, Peggy, you did get the castle bar. In fact, later that day, I went and backtracked it. The tracks and it had gone, it come out of the elder swamp, it had outflanked the hunters here. It couldn't know they were there, but that's the way it went. And uh, maybe you heard us approaching, you know, we we're pretty quiet, but it, this is near enough so maybe a castle buck could hear you coming. I don't know. But anyway, it had come out of that elder swamp way over here and gone pretty much straight along this, on this really well. I used deer trail heading toward swamp. And at this point, it wasn't far from there. It almost made it, and she dropped it there. So that was our first group, large group hunt. You know, stand hunt, and that's a really good hunting method. Cover all bases when you know enough about a big buck. So you, like, I know one that it wasn't just trails like this. It, I know where this buck fed every day, but every time I hunted there, he fed on the other side of this feeding area. You couldn't see him there. Every time I hunted along one of the trails that he used, and that there were two major ones, every time I hunted close to one of those, stand hunting, he used the other one. <laughs> I could keep alternating, nothing would happen. And I didn't want to hunt close to the bedding area because I already knew at that time. That's not such a good thing to do if you goof up, because if you goof up, if you ruin the safety of that big buck's bedding area, he's gone for the season. You ruin the safest place he knows, where he can rest and not be bothered by wolves or bears, or wild bears or in hibernation in November, or, or humans. And so when he, that's not safe anymore, he's going to get out of there. So I don't like to hunt 
Buck bedding areas. I haven't for many years now, although I used to take them there under different circumstances. But anyway, so, but that, I remember on that one group hunt, we had all these spots that the buck would use or, or where he would hunt covered. And again, I was close to where he bed. This time I was going to be there because I figured if he gets by everybody else, he, he'll get to, he'll come here and I'll have a chance, you know. And he almost made it. <laughs> the last hunter he had to get by was my son Ken. But at that point he didn't, that buck wasn't, he thought, maybe he thought he had outflanked everybody and he didn't have to worry anymore. But it, Buck had no idea he was near when he walked up close to Ken and he got down it with one shot. But that was one of those bucks when I walked up and said, Oh, my buck! <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't think that here, but what a thing that was for Peggy. You know, that's the thing, you know. I, again, I remember saying, how come we don't get tested at bucks like this? Well, we were just getting to be good at stand hunting at that point and using elevated stands. I won't go into that, but he was not as careful. Uh, he tended to, if he saw one, all he wanted to do is shoot a quick. Sometimes he shot from the hip, <laughs> which was kind of crazy. But I, I was always too anxious, and so were my sons when they were young. If a buck was walking toward them, they'd probably shoot at him way over there rather than wait for him to get up close. And I did the same thing on several occasions and kicked myself. I, Jeez, if I just waited, I would have gotten that buck. And so, but. Somehow I never had to explain that to my daughters. Uh, Peggy got them up close when Katie, my youngest daughter, my fifth child, when she, uh, she started hunting, uh, I remember one time uh, I was going to photograph her shooting a buck. I had this trail and there the antler rubs on it and one that was just freshened and that was in November and I was, had learned that by that time how important a really fresh ground scrape uh, in November, while does are in estrus, can be a dynamite place to sit. You can sit by all kinds of other ground scrapes. If they aren't freshened and they didn't care if they're freshened by deer or man, you know, uh, 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 man-made ground scrapes, people do that quite often now, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. If it hasn't been really freshened, hours earlier, then it's a, you're wasting your time there, no matter how much lure scent you use along with it. But I thought, this looks awfully good. So I put Katie in a nine-foot tree stand, and this time, this time it was a, that was at a time when we had portable tree stands you put up in trees, and we even had climbing tree stands back then, so I had a portable for Kate up there, nine feet up, and oh, that was a cold morning. And I was sitting in another tree about, oh, 30 yards away with a, with a big camera, movie camera, and a video camera, and waiting for her to get a nice sequence of Katie shooting this big buck. Well, first of all, here it came. <laughs> oh, we had been out there a couple of hours by that time. Here it came. And a whole boy came in, and, and I was wondering if she was going to spot it because it was kind of coming from behind her this way on the trail, not too far away. And Chris, oh, she spotted it, and she turned really slowly as it went by, and she got her gun up, and she seemed to be struggling, and I didn't know what, and she didn't shoot and didn't shoot and she didn't, and finally it was gone. I thought, what in the world? She, when she, we, I went over to where Katie was, and she's dead. I'm sorry, but my finger was so froze I couldn't even shoot a gun, <laughs> and that buck got away. But uh, it was a cold morning. But she, she could have taken a really nice one that year. But once she did get, you know, we used, that was one of our early uh, uses of a new hunting method, a uh, stand hunting method that we call the gentle nudge. And boy, did that work to perfection. She got a nice big 10 pointer 25 feet away. That the trail was only about 25 feet from where she was sitting in a hollow stump. And she got that. 
pretty easy for us. She saw several deer before that one came along. So that was a pretty exciting one. But my girls were be they were really good at being patient, really good. I didn't have to talk to them a lot about, about waiting till the thing is close before they shoot, so they should be sure to get it. And where me and my boys in the in the early years where we weren't so patient and what I'm saying is I think girls, at least my girls, have, were better under pressure. You said, well, what pressure? That well, you got a big buck right there. It's coming toward you. You're in, near an unusual pressure. It's like a big bear coming to you and you're bearing. You, that is really unusual pressure. You're pretty excited when this happens. And those two girls, that excitement didn't bother them. They did things really well. They, so to this day, it's my impression that women can be every good, every bit as, as uh, successful taking older bucks as men, if not better, if given the chance. So, yeah, you guys that think it's wished <laughs> having a woman can, uh, you're wrong. Women are great hunters. They are and they're likely to be better than you are. Maybe that's one reason you don't want them in camp. So, yeah, I remember my uncle was talking about it, and you know, and I happened to mention it, well, how come none of the Nordberg women hunt deer? Well, they just don't, you know, he said, and my granddad too, Grandpa Nordberg, I asked him that question, he said, no, even back in the old country, I was Scandinavian countries when he was a boy, women never hunted deer there. Or, or animal, moose or whatever, uh, that just, they, most of them didn't even want to. It was just kind of thing, it was a man thing to do. And uh, you had to be kind of tough and rugged and the, it didn't feel like women were tough and rugged enough and uh, uh, and women might be soft hearted and it would be, they would, they would, they'd be reluctant to shoot something and it would get away and, gee, what a waste of a good place to hunt or a chance to get a deer that was important back in the old days, you know, to have a shoot a moose or a deer to have meat for the winter, you know, it's important. Or a bear, to get, get bear grease made into lard for for the winter. They they used bear bear grease lard. Uh, that was the best best fat you could use to make pie crusts and all kinds of cakes and whatever back in the old days. And, and a lot of women said, boy, you just got to shoot a bear for the winter. That was important. But anyway, women just weren't expected to go hunting and they weren't apt to. And a lot of guys felt like they didn't want them around when they're hunting. It's more serious. It's a man thing. But um, they're more and more, well, you look, you know, you can look at the internet now and there's all kinds of women that are hunting today. And rightfully so. They're, they're good hunters. So. And uh, they sure changed my mind. And they, I, whereas there, what Peggy had done didn't make all that bunch that were still making drives every day with, you know, under the direction of my uncle Jack. Uh, they, they probably were thinking about that quite a bit when he heard the story about the nice bucks. We were getting a nice one that Peggy got. You know, here a female of all things get bucks like that. <laughs> that was in the days when that was just kind of a rare thing. And my mother, I remember my grandmother, my other, both grandmothers. I remember them asking me when I was young, "How could you shoot such a pretty thing like a deer?" And of course, I didn't know anything about that back in those days. <laughs> I said, "Well, you yeah, aim." Right behind the shoulder, and you should, and you know that wasn't quite the, what they were thinking about, you know. But um, it, it was easy for me to understand why there was no women in my family that ever hunted deer before. They might go fishing or things on go berry picking. Lots of things they would do, but they wouldn't do that. And my wife, even my own wife, she refused to hunt. Um, she didn't like the sound of gunshots in the woods, and so she didn't even want to be in the woods while hunting was all going on. But she always accompanied me when I went scouting and getting ready for my hunting schools, and she loved that. Oh, she loved that. I got a picture on the internet, you know, it's on the screen all the time, of her sitting on a log 
with a little fire going in front there, and she's got her a new camel outfit on. <laughs> it was a tree bark camel. And we were doing some scouting in preparation for one of my hunting schools, and there was her green backpack there, and in that was all her camera gear, because she loved wildlife photography, and boy, that was just a big thing for her, to have a camera along and get pictures. And, and I'd ask her, oh, gee, get some pictures of this track, or these droppings over here, or this bed over here, or this antler rub, ground scrape, thing like that. Take pictures. And this book here has got hundreds of her pictures in it, <laughs> because that was her hobby, her main hobby. She loved it. But, but no hunter. But, but um, we're, things are changing. <laughs> so modern day women are great hunters. Yeah. So don't be reluctant. If somebody, if you got a daughter that would like to be a hunter, you're going to have a hunting partner for the rest of your life. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah, I remember, well, my buddy Silver, my, my hunting buddy from Thorpe, Wisconsin, come to deer camp. He loves to hunt where we are. And he likes hunting with us. And, <laughs> and he marvels that he learned so, many, so much about how we hunt, that's how we stand hunting. And it worked really good for him. I put him in some really good spots where he'd take a nice bucks. And anyway, he's got a daughter and uh, his only child. But he made a hunter out of her, and she comes and hunts with him in Wisconsin, deer every year. And she's taken some really nice bucks, and so is Silver. And, and he's getting up there, and he's his daughter's married now, and, and um, they. But they still come together every year to hunt. It's like my family, you know, our deer camp was that's almost completely Nordbergs, <laughs> and with some in-laws, and uh, so. Uh, that's so great. That's, what, you know, my boys are all successful in their own right in many ways, the jobs they do and all that. And somehow, the kind of work they do keeps them busy a lot. I mean, it isn't something like where we can, every weekend get together, we can all go fishing, every, well, let's take a canoe trip in Canada. We, we've done a lot of that in the past. They're really busy people. And got new little grandkids and great grandkids, you know, all that we, we just can't get to be together very often. And this year we haven't been able to get together at all, all summer long, because of COVID-19. We've had to be really careful. Well, nice thing about deer running is that that's one time we all get together. This year we've got to do it very carefully. <laughs> no, People sleeping in separate tents. Well, our camp is going to look like the state fair with all the tents are on. <laughs> but anyway, um, but it's a wonderful time to get together with your kids year after year when they become hunters, and and uh, and it goes on for life, a lifetime. And uh, um, so, yeah. So nice to think about. Well, with that. You know, enough said about today and the taking and spot. What you'll see, you'll see the picture of the big one now. And uh, I'll tell John, keep it on screen a little bit. It's kind of a little bit funny back in that. We didn't have digital cameras back in those days. And, and, and look, it's a little bit fuzzy picture, but look at this book. He is such a dandy. It's a beautiful big book, the castle book. And uh, it's a story that us Nordbergs will never forget. And older Nordbergs never forgot either, although most of them are gone now. They're in happy hunting grounds up there somewhere today, most of them. And uh, so that's the story for today. Now, before you go, be sure to poke that subscribe button. I wish you would. And it'll be for your own good. You'll, you'll be told immediately when one of my new YouTube uh, presentations is, is shown on the screen, you know, within minutes, you can be one of the first to see it. So, other things too. Be sure to hit the, the thumbs up button too. And I hope you've been enjoying these, these stories about individual big bucks we've been taking over. There's all kinds of stories about others that aren't as big as the ones that we've been talking about, but are still mighty fine, mature bucks. And I guess I could go on like this for years. But the idea is here is to show you how the things we've learned over the years 
how we put these things together and created uh, hunting methods that are specific for taking huge bucks and, uh, and using them to success year after year. And uh, we've got six of these hunting methods now, seven actually, but they're all fair chase. They, they, we don't use lures to take these, uh, to take bucks today. And uh, well, we're still using tree stands. They, they're, you got to use them in some places. There's no other way to do it. Uh, but a good number, a big number, half or more every year, last day it was more, are taken from ground level using our backpacks tools. And, uh, but all these different methods for taking deer under different circumstances, like waking up when we got a northeast wind, this would be a good time to hunt the castle buck. You know, put the whole gang together, everybody get to their places without the buck knowing it, and uh, it works out. So, well, thanks again, guys. I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.